Hello, greetings. This, my name is Adam Baroni, the pastoral intern at Living Faith Lutheran Church in Pembroke Pines. And again, it is my pleasure to um, preach today on this beautiful second week after Pentecost. I, I always love um, remembering the different um, weeks of the church. Yes, I love that our gospel passage today, you know, Jesus being so well versed said, I desire um, mercy and not sacrifice. And then beautifully in our liturgy, um, they also in our um, Old Testament lesson, um, I think the first reading, you know, Hosea, this is where Jesus quotes it from Hosea says, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. So a little bit of a variation, but very cool. So today's message I would love to share. Um, I wanted to talk about something that's no strange to us. The nuns. Now, I'm not talking about Roman Catholic nuns. I was about to say who wear the habit, the black gown, but nuns don't even wear the habit anymore. They, they got rid of that habit, you might say. No, but anyways, the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Uh, the so That's what they're so called. But really, it's what the Pew Center would say is the demographic in our society that has no religious affiliation. They're irreligious. Um, according to the Pew... One fifth of the U.S. public and a third of adults under 30 are religiously unaffiliated today. The highest percentage ever in the famous Pew Research Center polling. In the last five years alone, the unaffiliated has increased from just over 15 percent to just now under almost 20 percent of U.S. adults. Their ranks now include more than 13 million self-described atheists and agnostics, as well as nearly 33 million people who say they have no particular religious affiliation. So, you know, irreligious people come in all shapes and sizes. Um, agnostic, meaning people who are open to a belief in God. Atheists who just have a belief that there is no God, period. Um, you know, and this isn't just a Pew research thing. Um, I mean, for me personally, being a, a member, being uh, born in 1992, I'm a millennial, or what's also called Generation Y. And even, you know, knowing people in Generation Z, or the Zoomers, we're all on Zoom. I'm recording this on Zoom. That's the generation after me. You know, a lot of my friends are nuns. Um, I would even say my best friend is a nun. Growing up in school, growing up in my circle, you know, not really having many friends in church, young people, that is. Yeah, it's it's real. Nuns, like a, mo and a lot of young people, as we know, are just irreligious, um, especially here in our South Florida community. But it's not just exclusive to the secular life. I had a friend in um, seminary, uh, at Luther Seminary. It was a young lady. She was, she was finishing up her culminating internship that culminating means you're finishing up your classes and internship at the same time one shot she was doing her internship at augsburg university last year and she shared in our internship cluster which is kind of like a, a thing where all interns get together that 
at her ministry site there at that university, Augsburg, which is historically Christian, a Lutheran ELCA seminary. Um, actually, the majority demographic she shared is non-Christian, including nuns, Muslims, and the list goes on. And that was very shocking to me. You know, it, it even kind of like, like, how can you be a chaplain or a Christian minister in a majority non-Christian setting? Where most people that go to your chapel, and I, it goes to interfaith. There's interfaith services. There's Christian services. Uh, I think Muslims had uh, a special place. But so her her primary ministry was non Christians. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> Isn't it fascinating? Like think about that. But then look at our gospel text today, my friends. Was Jesus Christ ministering to Christians? Not exactly. Some people believed that he was the Messiah. I mean, we have Mary Magdalene. We have, um, you know, some other apostles and disciples who explicitly recognized Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the chosen one. But then you also had but most disciples were on the seesaw. They, you know, they didn't really know if Jesus was just a prophet, just a teacher. Most people, a lot of Jews obviously didn't um, think much of him and pagans even worse. That's where we see Christ today in our gospel. You know, Christ is breaking bread with sinners and tax collectors people of ill repute in the Jewish society's eyes in that context. You see there, Christ was doing ministry with people who were nuns, people of different faiths, people that wouldn't have got him immediately, literally sitting there. Again, Jesus defied the religious norms and societal norms by making himself unclean. A rabbi, you know, Jesus was a rabbi. He he was like a, a priest or a pastor, somebody who you wouldn't expect, who you kind of think of as high and mighty. Well, it might be more helpful to put yourself not in our modern context, but think of the a priest, right? They were thinking priests had to stay holy. They had to stay separate from dirty, unclean things, irreparable people. It's kind of just think of the stereotypical view that you have of holy people, of monks, of priests. Like they would not be seen like in those kind of areas, especially of different religions where the, the role of a clergy person is, is really highly elevated. So that's basically the context of the of the Jewish people at this time, that the rabbis and the priests, especially sometimes those words are synonymous. They were not supposed to be getting unclean, being with the, the simpletons. So Jesus made himself unclean by touching the corpse of a child. There's like four things that happen. So Jesus eats with irreparable people, which is unbecoming of a rabbi. He then makes himself unclean by touching the corpse of a child, even being in the presence of that. And then he touches a hemorrhaging woman who's bleeding and issuing blood and everything for years. But it's interesting to note that that woman also defied laws by touching Christ, by even being out in public. Because the Jewish law requires women who are issuing blood to be out of the community, even up to 12 years, which is a holy number in that time. So, again, this brings me back to the point of the nuns. This brings me back to the point of 
what our demographics are these days. Pretty like a post, as some scholars say, a, a post Christian society. Jesus Christ was operating in a similar situation where nobody was a Christian, practically nobody. And Christ literally had to interject and put himself in the lives of, of non Christians and be a force of change, be a godly force. Of liberation, love, and mercy. Even when Christ, who in a way is just the first Christian when you think about it, he being the one that the Father had sent into the world, he had to recruit his first Christians, right? Or his first to be Christians, one just by randomly walking and finding people. Now, Christ, you know, being so inclusive, putting himself in the lives of these um, of these people, he expanded his circle of welcome far beyond the bounds of what was culturally or socially acceptable. So I think this calls us to look at our own lives as modern day um, Christians, modern day religious folk. Are our pews and or dinner guests primarily those who look and think just like we do? Or do our social gatherings mirror the broad and inclusive welcome of Jesus as we see today, dining with sinners, dining with people of ill repute, of people of different faiths, of unclean folk? So, you know, our Lord in this passage calls us to reach out to those deemed unclean. Those whom religion has shamed and alienated, including our very own. Those whom are, are those, those nuns, those irreligious people. Those of different faiths. Even those whom poke and mock our faith, we are to reach out to even our enemies. But my friends, with the same grace and mercy that we receive each day from our Lord Jesus Christ, we can do it. Christ can work through us with that breastplate of mercy and faith constantly on our person, on the temple of our bodies. We are to sit, talk, work, help, pray, and be vulnerable for the sake of the kingdom of God, for the sake of love. Remember what 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12 says? God is love. You know, I think like our secular culture really champions love. And I, I have no problem with that. Because uh, we as Christians understand that love is not just some word, just some random word that we're worshiping and idolizing, but that love is in fact God. First John chapter 4, verse 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. You know, so may love embolden and stir us, my friends, in the ordinary places of our lives to reach out and fish for people. 
by faith in Jesus and accepting that call to follow him into the world, we can be creative and great things can happen. Just like my friend, my intern friend at Augsburg University, she was creative in her ministry. Ministry doesn't mean just ministering to Christians. It means everybody. Just as Christ randomly asked Matthew, the tax collector, this uh, to come and follow him as he worked in his tax booth, sheltered strategically, you know, near the route of the area of Galilee where fishermen would transport their catch. You know, Matthew is collecting taxes. You know, people of that time, just they, they would have written Matthew off as someone religiously non-observant because of his state occupation, his allegiance with the emperor. Jews would have looked down upon such people as being equal to murderers and swindlers, just another sellout conformist, just a, a nun. It'll be a equivalent as if people were to say, hey, like, why are you bothering with that nun, that atheist? Don't even talk to him. You're, you're wasting your time. You're embarrassing yourself. But Jesus Christ deemed him equally worthy and straight up asked him, Follow me. Matthew, enamored by our Savior's boldness and command, left his menial job and got up and followed him. As the scripture puts it simply, now this Matthew, you know, again, this Matthew, who I just got done describing as being of somebody who you don't think People would not even have thought of being anything, let alone a convert to the faith. We are reading the Gospel of Matthew today. He is one of the four evangelists. You know, as legend has it, Matthew continued his ministry long after Christ's ascension in the Middle East. And ultimately, as legend has it, was martyred while preaching the gospel in Egypt, killed with the spear, martyred. Can and can you believe this, guys? This this Matthew was just in this booth, doing his cushy job, until his encounter with Jesus demanded that he a life altering encounter, the most important encounter and request from our Lord changed his life I think he made the right call so you know and even I think about Jesus in my own life you know I'm I'm when I felt Christ calling me right I'm by nature a very shy and timid person even right now I'm shaking in my boots doing this recording well Okay, maybe not literally, but there was a time. I'm still growing in confidence. You know, I'm still I'm still learning to be a public figure and, and being okay with that. People Googling me, seeing my name all on the internet, knowing everything. Uh, well, not everything, but a lot about me. But you know, I'm just, in a way, I, I, I follow the examples of Moses, Gideon, David who at the outset were also very humble and lacked confidence and had a dialogue with God. You know, like, I don't know if you picked the right person, God. I'm this, this, and that. But you know what? This isn't about us. This is about the call in our hearts as disciples. This isn't about me and my shyness. This is about this call and this love for Jesus and the gospel that I have. It says, hey, Adam, put aside these inhibitions because preaching salvation in Jesus Christ is more important. Proclaiming liberty to the captives, recovery to the sight of the blind, and to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, my friends. This is Jesus Christ. This is our salvation. This is the good news of eternal life. 
This is what we are, the joy that we live in each day and the message we are entrusted to share in word and deed each day. St. Paul writes, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. May the Holy Spirit who resides in the temple of our bodies embolden us with these fruits of the Spirit. abundantly so that we may have this and share the gospel with everyone we encounter. Yes, my friends, the nuns are on the rise, but they are not nuns. They are sons. They are daughters. They are children of God like us. Amen. I think I, I, you know, like I think the last time I preached to you guys, we had a, I shared a, a picture, and I would like to share another picture commemorating this. You know, we're blessed as Christians to have Renaissance artists paint practically every scene of the Bible. So this one's from Paolo Vernisi. I might have butchered that name, Italian. A 16th century painting of the healing of the bleeding woman. The artist has shown the woman's hand extended, reaching out to touch Jesus' cloak. So let's see if I can share this screen here. Here we are. Very nice. <laughs> okay. So yes, what a beautiful painting. What a beautiful painting indeed. Really, really cool. See the, the apostles around Christ look a little bit more like what? But Christ is cool. All right, my friends. God bless you. Go forth in God's grace and mercy. And reach out today to not just those who think and act like this, but to everybody with confidence and faith and mercy towards others and ourselves goodbye my friends god bless and see you at this anybody who's going at the sin and assembly don't be shy to say hi to me peace